sound check uh, should be coming on live in just a second. I think we are live. Hi, everybody. Uh, Der Stiefel, Carlos, Dave Williams, all the regular folks, and welcome. So in a few minutes, I am getting a little feedback, and I need to kill that. So, good to see you, and let me just get rid of some sound on my end. That should be better, hopefully. So, um, uh, welcome. We're going to have an interesting uh, live stream today, I hope. Uh, we're going to have a special guest from Grand Seiko, uh, Joe Kirk, who should be Skyping in shortly. And... Uh, he is the brand curator for Grand Seiko USA and the uh, chief trainer. And Joe's been very busy this week. He's been training all the retailers uh, for a couple of hours a day uh, using his uh, live stream setup. And uh, I know he's been extremely busy. He's about two and a half hours a day every day this week. And I was able to sit in yesterday, and uh, very informative. And I hope that Joe will have some uh, good stuff for us. And uh, okay, so sound is good. And uh, uh, Carlos, feeling sorry for uh, Mr. Trump, looked with low spirits in his press conference. And uh, today he purchased a Trumpy bear. And, uh, great. So, uh, I'm waiting for Joe to uh, Skype in, or uh, I can Skype to him. Let's see what happens. Oh, there you are. There we go. Okay, um, Joe, I'm going to uh, uh, pop you on in a second. Uh, I think everything's fine. You're hearing me okay? Yep, I hear you just fine. Okay, great. So let's, uh, let's bring uh, Joe in. And uh, whoops, that's not Joe. This is Joe. Okay, welcome to our uh, little live stream. And uh, we're going to... Uh, uh, introduce you and uh, find out what it is that uh, a, a brand uh, uh, person such as yourself does, brand curator. Um, what is, what's your job description, Joe? Uh, where to begin? Where to begin? <laughs> so, um, you know, basically what, uh, what my role started as uh, with, uh, with at least I'm based out of the corporate offices, you know, I was at the in Miami for a couple of years before I came to New Jersey, New York area. But um, as opposed to working in the boutique now, uh, what what my role entails is uh, mostly uh, training. So I do all the all the technical mm -hmm. training and training for for all of our retail partners across the country, uh, as well as our boutiques. And uh, I also work with a lot of media, uh, furthering education on Grand Seiko. So really, that's what my uh, you know, my title is really just kind of watch nerd for Grand Seiko. And you certainly are. I haven't seen you stumped yet uh, with any questions. So uh, um, you're pretty remarkable. So how many times have you visited uh, the facilities over there in Japan? Uh, I've only been now twice. I was supposed to be there. Uh, I believe yourself as well. Uh, just this last month, at the beginning of, of March, we were supposed to be there for the... Uh, GS Summit, but unfortunately, due to the situation, that was canceled, and now uh, everyday life. Uh, right, back to that. But it's old, so. Okay, great. So uh, we're bringing in a few folks on here. I see Luis R is on, and uh, uh, got about 17 folks uh, watching, and I urge those yeah, who. I'm going to myself here, so. Uh... Yeah, you just uh, listen to the Skype. Don't listen to the uh, the yeah, other. Yeah, the volume's all down. 
down on that one. No yeah. worries. So you gotta gotta be careful about that. Get a little confused. So um, anyhow, um, now you're here. I think some of us like to uh, hear about uh, what's what's new that you can discuss. We obviously haven't had a reveal on all of the uh, 2020 novelties, uh, given the circumstances. Uh, but uh, there's some technical advances that I think are pretty exciting that you um, might want to uh, brief us on, if you will. Yeah, no. So we've, uh, you know, as opposed to having the, the GS Summit in Japan that we were supposed to, um, basically what uh, what we did was we just announced it digitally. So at this point, uh, you know, in for the unforeseeable future, uh, that's, you know, how, how we're going to be having to make these announcements for our 60th anniversary. Obviously, here, uh, you know, it's kind of a celebration of the rebirth of Grand Seiko. I don't know if you're aware of this, but um, you know, culturally, at least in Japan, uh, celebration of 60 years, uh, the 60th birthday, if you will, uh, is is really a celebration of rebirth. Uh, as a, it's 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 a completion of the full uh, traditional zodiac. So mm -hmm. that's uh, you know, a very big deal to celebrate. So this is why. Um, you'll see a lot of uh, red accents on some of the limited editions we've launched so far this year, along with, of course, the Grand Seiko Blue, uh, because red is kind of a symbol of, of, of birth, or in this instance, rebirth. We have um, just launched two really revolutionary new calibers. So I think that's what everyone is most excited about now. And, uh, you know, with this launch of this new product, we're really, uh, uh, really excited about that. And... You know, I mean, realistically, there's uh, probably a ton of questions on these movements. We've disclosed a, a good amount of information, um, but you know, we're we're here today to hopefully answer some questions and and uh, you know, give give people some more info. Okay, great. So um, I got a couple questions on uh, Joe's volume. I uh, adjusted it. Is that uh, doing a little better, folks? Uh, just let me know. And can you, uh, can you hear me? I can hear you fine. Um, someone on the uh, chat has uh, indicated it was a little bit low, so I, I think we're good. So, uh, what about these uh, new thinner movements? What are you? What's going on with them? So the new thinner movements, uh, you know, aside from from being thinner, uh, there's a lot going on with them. Uh, we've made advancements in terms of duration, in terms of, of uh, technology, you know, depending on what you're talking about, we have spring drive, we have high beat now. Um, so these two new movement types are, um, you know, really, I mean, groundbreaking in a lot of different ways. So very much pushing the envelope in terms of what we were doing in the past and kind of uh, paving a new path for ourselves in the future. So uh, if you'd like, I can share some some slides with you that uh, kind of go over the topic, um, you know, just to... Let me jump on here real quick and okay, and pull this up for you. All right. Losing your voice, uh, Joe. Uh, Still losing. Okay, my there voice. you are. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm... Yep. Bear with me. I'm just pulling up this slide here. Okay, so. great. Thank you. Switch it over to the screen share. All right, you able to see that all right, Steve? Yeah, yep, that's good. Great. All right, so this is our new 9S A5 caliber. This is going to be our new high beat 36,000. Um, basically, what we've done is is we've evolved uh, in every single form of watchmaking. So first and foremost, uh, we're coming out with the first overcoil ever used in, in Grand Seiko, uh, which is pretty revolutionary in, in its own uh, right for the brand. But also the fact that uh, we developed this overcoil, which you know, there's there's a lot of patented aspects uh, to this movement, um, and you know, some of which are pertaining to this. Uh, we actually determined the optimal shape of this overcoil uh, based on 80,000 different simulations. So 80,000 simulations to determine this one shape before we could really even start uh, progressing into manufacturing it. So a lot of work work went into the development there. Okay, so, so what does that overcoil buy you uh, functionally? 
Uh, what an overcoil does is it prevents. Um, I don't know, can you see my mouse moving there? Uh, I can see the mouse. Right. Yeah. You can see the cursor. All right. So typically, uh, the hairspring when uh, when you use um, let's say a, a regulating mechanism, um, you know, for for Grand Seiko as it stands right now. Uh, and the 9S85 caliber is an example. The mm -hmm. hairspring is flat. There's no coil over the top. Right. And that's fed into a regulating mechanism, a uh, regulator um, that adjusts the length of the hairspring. Mm -hmm. So in in this new overcoil, we're doing uh, we're also adding a free sprung balance. So there is no regulator to to change the length per se of, of the hairspring. But the mm -hmm. overcoil is going to optimize performance in uh, and uh, how concentric the, the shape is uh, across all positions. So it's going to help stabilize the accuracy of, across uh, the various positions. Okay. So that's the point of the overcoil. Got it. But then we also have the free sprung balance, uh, which gives you more stability in, long t in the long term uh, compared to using a regulator balance. So a lot of added benefits, but we've also added some features that have not been done before on various other aspects of these components I'm talking about, uh, pertaining to the overcoil as well mm -hmm. as pertaining to the, the free sprung. So, okay. And like I said, some of this stuff is patented, so. Right. Uh, okay, patent great. Pen. Okay. The other aspect is the, the new dual impulse escapement. So this is really a, a, a big deal for us, and a lot of people have been really fascinated by it. So I think this is really what kind of opened people's eyes uh, to Grand Seiko's mechanical watchmaking. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone's uh, by spring drive, I think, at this point. You know, everyone's pretty well aware of what spring drive is, what it does. Um, you know, the high beat in itself, the 9S85, the current one, is, is a phenomenal caliber and, mm -hmm. and really just you know, over the top uh, when it was introduced, especially in 2009. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, succeeding that tremendously in an entirely new design that's providing, uh, as, a, as an, in the name, two impulses, dual impulses, right? One mm -hmm. is indirect, like you would get with a conventional uh, lever escapement, mm -hmm. but the other one is a direct impulse to the balance wheel uh, that you'll see this jewel, it's, it's directly... Uh, getting that energy from the escape wheel direct to the balance, which is going to improve the amplitude or the, the and also you know the the isochronism of the watch. So you have direct and indirect working together uh, to create this more stable transfer of energy. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be just in the high beats. Yeah, this will only be uh, incorporated into this new high beat 36,000 caliber. Okay. And, um, well, and will that be, about it? That'll be in all oh, of the sorry. high beats? No, just in uh, just in the one watch so far. Yeah, okay. So the limited yeah, edition okay. in gold, yeah. Okay, let's but, catch um, up on a couple of questions. Um, yeah, of course. Uh, so here's one uh, from Dave Williams. Uh, well, let's start with Mighty Rat. Uh, is the snowflake okay. getting a new movement? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. And, <laughs> oh, I don't uh, think go ahead. Uh, it, to kind of touch on, on that subject, I don't think any time in the foreseeable future that, uh, that you're going to see these movements replacing the current ones. I think that they're going to coexist. Um, if I had to guess, you know, there's going to be essentially two tiers of spring drive, two tiers of high beat now. Okay. Good to know. So, um, well, so Dave Williams asks, uh, will future case sizes be thinner or smaller? So, so yes, in the sense that uh, we're introducing thinner calibers with uh, with these two new movements. So mm -hmm. we are able to reduce the, the thickness overall. In terms of width, uh, we average about 40 millimeters and is also, you know, kind of the best selling size. Uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, I can't really speak to what we're going to come out with in the future. Just uh, mm -hmm. you know what we what we currently have today, and we have you know our range is pretty much uh, 37 millimeters to you know I mean our our sports watches obviously can get up there between 44, mm -hmm. 47, uh, but that's as large as they go. 
So, you know, our average size is about 40, which is, uh, you know, in terms of overall sales, comparing 37 mm -hmm. and 40, you know, I mean, most people gravitate towards 40, so. Sure. And I see Der Stiefel, a regular here, is uh, double fisting two Grand Seikos uh, in your honor, SBGA uh, 229 and the Snowflake. Go way to go, Der Stiefel. Nice. Thank and you. Lewis R., uh, following up, uh, when will thinner cases and new caliber be available in regular non-special edition watches such as SBGA 375? And he has three years, five years. And I know you're not to do too much prognosticating, uh, but is there anything you can respond to in that? No, I mean, uh, you know, obviously, uh, like I said uh, just a moment ago, I can't really a answer questions about future product. Um, so, you know, unfortunately there's limitations there, but, um, it, I don't think we would go through the, the hassle of developing new calibers without a plan to introduce them at some point in time. So mm -hmm. in, in a, in a regular, maybe not uh, so regular production scale, but you know, mm -hmm. this is, uh, you know, like I said, this is kind of a stepping stone into the, into the future. for. The right. Brand. And so, e even for so. you, I, I'm guessing some of this hasn't been shared with you. So. Okay. Of so, course, yeah. It's, yeah. Um, you're best in the dark about things. Right. So um, uh, Kyle Jett asks, uh, why can't we get a 36 millimeter spring drive? Well, first of all, uh, the, there's size limitations in terms of, you know, every spring drive movement has well over 200 components starting. So to, to reduce the width is a challenge in itself. Mm -hmm. um, with so many components, as well as the thickness. So, you know, this was, uh, even though, you know, it doesn't seem like a lot, but this new spring drive caliber that we introduced that uh, I'll jump forward a little bit here. And I've got these slides just uh, kind of here to mm -hmm. kind of prove that point. But, you know, we, we shaved off the overall thickness uh, 0.8 millimeters in spring drive, which is pretty remarkable. It doesn't sound like a lot, but, you know, as movements get thinner, you you can compromise overall rigidity or durability, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, and especially in mechanical watches, uh, depending on, on what you're doing, you know, you're also potentially sacrificing accuracy. Right. So to, to make thinner movements, um, first and foremost, you know, we need to make sure that they have the durability that falls in line with Grand Seiko's standards in terms of, of robustness. So, and longevity, mm -hmm. you know, Parts are made thicker and, and more robust uh, in order to preserve the lifespan, uh, make sure that the watch works well and, of course, performs well. So, you know, to reduce the, the thickness of this watch by 0.8 millimeters and to also increase the durability, uh, which, which we managed to do with this particular movement, is amazing. Mm. But reduce the overall width based on quantity of components is... Um, you know, I don't, I don't foresee that happening anytime soon. You know, right, right now mm -hmm. as it stands, the smallest spring drive that, that we really have uh, is 39 millimeters in the lineup. Um, so, so, you know, that's kind of where I'll, I'll uh, guesstimate it will stay for a while. Yeah, that's a good one. So uh, someone asked, uh, can you explain the difference for those who don't know between high beat and spring drive? Um, there are people who are anti-spring drive because they think it's simply a quartz movement. Yeah. No, I mean, it's a, a common misconception. You know, and a lot of people just misunderstand quartz in general. Quartz, uh, quartz to most people equals battery, which, you know, when you, you call a, a quartz movement a, a quartz movement, you know, it's because there's a quartz oscillator in there to, to develop a rhythm of time that's very accurate. Um, now, granted, most quartz watches uh, or, you know, watches that use quartz oscillators are powered by battery. Um, so that's where that misunderstanding, I think, comes into play, is people associate quartz with cheap battery-powered watches that are disposable. And, you know, obviously, Grand Seiko makes quartz, but those mm -hmm. are not cheap, they're not disposable. Those are built and engineered more like mechanical watches than they are quartz. Um, spring drive is really a, a mechanical watch that attains quartz accuracy. 
So there's no battery, there's no capacitor, but it regulates itself with the precision of quartz. So it's it's its own unique movement type. And yes, it has a quartz oscillator, but like I said, it's not to be confused with a quartz movement where most people think of as battery. Hide beat uses a traditional escapement, uh, a balance wheel to develop a rhythm of time as opposed to a quartz crystal, right? The balance wheel rocks back and forth and that determines how accurate the watch is. It's kind of like a pendulum in a grandfather clock, right? Grandfather mm -hmm. clock, pendulum swing back and uh, one complete revolution can be like one second, equivalent mm -hmm. to one second. Well, in, in wristwatches, most of them beat eight times to develop one second. So they have to oscillate back and forth eight times in one second. A high beat does that just with 10 back and forth motions per second. So it's kind of like old, old, uh, you know, technology more or less, but, you know, with modern manufacturing by today's standards for the high beat movement that we have. Great, great answer. So uh, Dave Williams just reports he's wearing his SBGN 005. And uh, Kyle Jett just purchased SBGX 261. Thank you, Kyle. And, uh, and if it looked the same and was a spring drive, that would be fantastic. Would pay double happily. It is uh, 37 millimeters. So we're hearing a bit of that. Um, Let's get that spring drive down inside. Okay. Yeah, yeah. maybe be in time. You know yeah. that. Uh, uh, you know, I I can try and look into my crystal ball, but I don't think it's going to produce much results. So, uh, Boozer uh, asks you to address something that's out of your purview about uh, regular Seikos uh, concerning misaligned chapter rings and bezels. I'm not sure if there's anything you want to say about that. Uh, Definitely a different company right now. Yeah, it, we're, you know, basically, uh, obviously, Seiko and, and Grand Seiko have split. So uh, as it stands right now, I'm only working for Grand Seiko. So, yeah, so not appropriate for him to uh, comment across the aisle, I think, at this point. But uh, uh, we hear you, you sir. And um, he uh, continues, I would compare Spring Drive to the Porsche 918 supercar. It's a hybrid able to achieve performance a combustion engine alone cannot. So, good point. And, good point. Uh, the, only, yeah. the only thing that uh, I kind of, I hesitate to call spring drive in, in its entirety uh, a hybrid. Because when people think of hybrid, they think of battery. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, you always have, you know, massive battery, right? right. So, um, with spring drive, Realistically, uh, the way I like to describe it is, you know, it's a, it's an automatic watch, it's a mechanical watch, but more or less so that it has a hybrid escapement. Mm -hmm. And again, it doesn't have storage uh, of energy or uh, electricity. It's all created from mechanical energy, so right. solely. But, and and all in house, including the crystal grown uh, uh, in house as well. So uh, the know quartz it. crystal. <laughs> so. Uh, uh, we're getting a little comments on the 9F, and uh, I listened to some of the training yesterday on that, and uh, it's uh, certainly more than just uh, your grandfather's quartz watch. Uh, do you want to talk about that movement a little bit and either sure. show us a movement or show us you, either way? You know, uh, you know I, yeah, let me uh, jump off of this because I don't have anything really on, on the quartz caliber uh, prepared, uh -huh. but... Let me turn the sharing off. Okay. All right. So, so that should be off now if you yep. can confirm that. Yep. We see your face. I'm sorry. No, I'm it's okay. Sorry. It's okay, Joe. We... <laughs> <laughs> Better than mine. Better than mine. <laughs> so, no, not at all. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I mean, for, for uh, the 9F Quartz, I mean, it's really, I mean, I think it's gaining a lot of traction. Again, going back to that, you know, people often associate mm -hmm. Quartz with cheap and disposable, and, and 9F is not created or engineered that way. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the whole concept is to make a Quartz watch with this ultra-high preci uh, precision that you cannot obtain with a mechanical watch or even with a spring drive um, that 
is built to last, you know, can be handed down to your, your kid and their kid to the, the next. You know, this is the concept or the idea uh, behind 9F because, you know, I mean, in reality, it didn't exist. You know, mm -hmm. now 9F is 27 years old and it stood the test of time thus far. And I, I can foresee it lasting many, many decades down the road mm -hmm. and still not being irrelevant. Right. And, uh, you know, granted, we did launch a new, uh, a new caliber um, with the independent adjust hour hand uh, just recently and at the end of January, uh, which you probably have in some of those new limited editions uh, that are coming in, the new 9F85. Mm -hmm. So so this new caliber uh, is, is basically the same as it's been just with that jumping hour hand feature. So in two years ago, we introduced that GMT, uh, the 9F86. Mm -hmm. so, believe it or not, um, our quartz caliber it has an instantaneous date, just like a mechanical watch does, uh, or would if all mechanical watches, let's say, had them. Um, but if you can think of a mechanical watch with an instantaneous date, the Quartz, the 9F Quartz, is the only Quartz watch in the world that has that same type of feature that's not driven by, like, an electronic motor or anything. It's all done, you know, with spring levers. And, mm. and, and um, you know, a lot of people ask why we don't ever do a perpetual calendar in 9F. That's the reason. The instantaneous date is fully mechanical. So if we were to ever do a perpetual calendar in 9F, I would imagine that it would have to be engineered mechanically, just like you would find in a, an automatic watch or a manual wine watch. So it would probably make a, for a very expensive uh, you know, quartz movement. Right. But okay. adding the GMT made it very difficult to retain that instantaneous date feature. So this is a kind of a big breakthrough in, in some of the components used for that quick set. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Um, so Imre Music, uh, new name to me, uh, asks, is it possible to make an anti-magnetic spring drive? Um, so yes, I would say yes, that it would be possible. Um, or at least, you know, to uh, obviously not, uh, you know, not uh, completely, but with higher magnetic resistance, of course, it, 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 I'm sure it is possible. You know, if you're talking about like maybe a thousand gauss or something along those lines, mm -hmm. uh, I think in theory, yeah, it could be done. Um, you know, just as, uh, you know, there's higher magnetic resistance quartz watches uh, that Grand Seiko has, has introduced before. Um, based on the fact that there's magnets utilized within the movement itself. And keep in mind, you know, all spring drives are rated for ISO standard of a dive watch. All spring drives are, you know, 4,800 amperes per meter magnetic resistance, mm -hmm. which is about 60 gauss. Doesn't sound like a lot when you think about, you know, 1,000 gauss and all the other, you know, exceedingly high. But that's ISO, the International Standards Organization, standard for a dive watch, which needs to be, you know, high magnetic resistance in order to be reliable, considered reliable. Right. All spring drives are, are at least within that standard. Okay, great. Um, uh, Der Stiefel asks, uh, Joe, for you to talk about uh, how little electricity is used with spring drive compared to how much power it takes to power a light bulb, for instance. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that, you've I've done, done this uh, before, yeah. eh? <laughs> I've, done, I've done this one before. Yeah. So um, in relation, uh, spring drive uh, consumes 25 nanowatts of energy. So this is uh, equivalent to every person on Earth, 7.5 billion people wearing a spring drive, which mm. could only power uh, uh, enough, you know, uh, basically to power a 150-watt light bulb, maybe a, a, a slight bit more. So it's also equivalent to... Uh, it's actually over uh, one three hundred millionth. It's actually closer to one four hundred millionth the power of a ten watt LED. Mm. One, almost one four hundred millionth. Wow. Is, uh, very very low power. Absolutely. Good. Thank you. So yeah. another question. Changing gears. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, Luis R talks about the uh, SBGY002 at mm -hmm. 38.5 millimeters and uh, it wouldn't mind the thickness of a spring drive if uh, Grand Seiko would only produce more 38 millimeter ones even a 38.5 uh, 
uh, millimeter 44 GS case would be a killer. This is true. Yeah. <laughs> this, so this new this this new uh, manual wind spring drive movement is in very small capacity, as as mm -hmm. you've learned. Uh, yes. It, it, definitely a challenge in terms of production yeah. so this is um you know this is not something you know maybe we okay yeah we introduced it last year we made 700 in steel and we're making very small quantities of of the gold uh as you've seen so far there's nothing this year in steel and i think a lot of people are sad about mm -hmm. that um but it's it's just kind of showing you that we're not at a at a big capacity for this particular caliber um, and mm. not that any Grand Seiko is, is a very big capacity, but you know this is uh, th this is an expression of that. So very very limited quantities on all of that stuff yet. So you're not going to see, you know, that probably for some time. So uh, changing gears a bit, uh, no pun intended. Uh, are there any YouTube channels that you follow? I watch related. Uh, watch related. I mean, most of the, you know, most of the, the bigger name medias, um, you know, is, is really all that I, I follow and it's, you know, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a workaholic a little bit, so you're too you busy, know, right? Really staring at my computer, but unfortunately, and usually not watching too many videos. So, okay, there you are. So Andrew Hoffer, uh, also a new, uh, name to me here. Uh, asked if you're able to make more complications for a spring drive besides GMT uh, date uh, that could be more complicated, like a chronograph or annual calendar. Well, there is a chronograph, so maybe yeah, you can address and, that. Yeah, and to, yeah. to give you an idea of the complexity of just making a chronograph GMT, you know, it, that is a grand complication. And, you know, you've I'm sure I've heard this enough already, but mm -hmm. you know, there's over 400 components in the spring drive chronograph GMT. You could be looking at a split second chronograph with a perpetual calendar, and it would be uh, roughly the same quantity of components mm. uh, in that type of movement. So, again, you're gonna you're gonna run into an issue of of space, I think, to you know really be able to do it all um, mm -hmm. because the spring drive movements are are so complex and have such a high quantity of components. Right. So, uh, by the way, on the Little Treasury uh, YouTube channel, and there is one, we're on uh, the Crave Ship channel right now, I have a video of uh, the assembly of a spring drive chronograph here in the store uh, when we had a uh, watchmaker in from Japan uh, demonstrating it. So uh, that's had almost 100,000 views. You might want to take a look at that. It's uh, an impressive uh, thing and and don't worry about the oil so many people have commented the person who gets that watch is going to be really sorry there's no oil well it's a, a demo piece that's been assembled and disassembled many times so okay so uh uh rafael paione asks will a new high beat movement be available in the lower end gmt soon again that's a prognostication i don't know what you're going to do with that joe yeah, uh, so I'm sorry, the new high beat caliber, the new 9S A series mm -hmm. uh, with a GMT in a lower price segment, uh, unfortunately, don't don't know, don't have the answer. And even if I did, I couldn't share it. Okay, so let's uh, steer away from the uh, the futures <laughs> questions, folks. It's yeah, like a, I mean, that's it, of course going to be everyone's you know first question. And it's always my question, too, is mm -hmm. what's coming next? And, uh, you know, I mean, listen, I, I don't blame any, any and everyone for, for being excited about these new mm -hmm. things. Um, I'm always excited about them, you know, and, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's one of the best things I think about this brand is there's constant innovation. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's that's it's always evolving. And this is, I think, the the best time is. We're showcasing that we have come up with this idea, so I don't think it's gonna, you know, go stale. I don't think they're just mm -hmm. gonna come up with one watch and and be done with it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they will evolve. So uh, Boozer asks that uh, or uh, remarks that uh, Grand Seiko seems to release many limited dis limited and special editions. Is there any concern this may oversaturate the market and cause confusion? over core product line with consumers like with Panerai and Omega. Now, you know, I mean, there, 
I mean, yeah, we introduce a, a fair amount of, of limited edition watches throughout the year. Um, with our core lineup, how many watches we have, let's say, in the core lineup in the United States, um, how many are in the core lineup, uh, you know, in Japan, um, you know, there's a decent amount of core product. Limited editions, you know, novelties, uh, as we call them, um, this is, uh, you know, kind of an essential part of, uh, of, you know, kind of launching new product is, you know, you're seeing this with these new movements. Mm -hmm is launching in a limited edition before, you know, we can kind of take it to the next level in terms of scale, in terms of being able to make something continuous. Mm -hmm. You know, and, you know, you've seen, there's not a lot of watchmakers behind the entire brand of Grand Seiko. So, you know, there is limited capacity in general for the brand overall. So, you know, mm -hmm. you're probably experiencing shortages with spring and winter right now. And, Likely in the future, I'm you know like uh, the new uh, 24 Seki or the Japan Seasons watches. Um, you know, I mean, it, you're experiencing firsthand the blue snowflake SPGA 407. Mm -hmm. You know, these are continuing models that we're having. You know, um, you know some some trouble delivering right now. Mm -hmm. okay. Joe, how many people actually assemble the Grand Seikos over there in Japan? So you have, you have uh, roughly about 20 watchmakers in each studio, so 20 in our northern mm -hmm. manufacturer that, you know, and this is roughly, these are rough estimates, um, roughly about 20 in, in Morioka in our northern manufacturer, the Shizuku Ishii studio, and then uh, about 20 in, in Nagano in our Shiojiri manufacturer, the Shinshu studio. So actually, it's fairly incredible that we're uh, seeing as many uh, pieces come through here as we are. We're just one part of the, the worldwide market. So, yeah. um, Japan's the biggest market. Yeah. Been there a lot longer. <laughs> yeah. So uh, how has the uh, virus epidemic affected the shipping and availability of Grand Seiko? Well, I think, uh, I think it's affected everyone. Um, you know, in terms of in terms of stores being open, in terms of, uh, you know, people go actually being able to go to work, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of challenges in that. And, uh, you know, we're, you know, like everyone, you know, we're all hoping this will, this will be, you know, uh, contained or, you know, controlled or, or you know, over soon. But, um, you know, I think that we're fortunate, uh, you know, in, in, what we've been able to do in this, you know, in this very tragic time. So, yeah, I agree. Um, as much as I can speak on it. So, uh, I think one of our earlier answers about how many watchmakers are uh, working answers the next question to a certain degree. Why is Seiko not making all models available all over the world? There are models only available in Japan. Yeah, and you're noticing over time that it is it has uh, become more global. So, yes, there are still Japanese domestic models. Um, but it's fewer than before. There were, there's there's less of that going on uh, today compared to what it was ten years ago or five years ago, even, mm -hmm. uh, even two years ago. It's a, it's a very big difference from then to now. So I think there will always be regional exclusive models. Uh, you're seeing that with U.S. exclusive models. Uh, you're seeing mm -hmm. that uh, you've been seeing that with Japanese domestic models. But you know there there will always be some regional stuff but it's becoming more of a global brand today. And I think it will continue from that path, without a doubt. Okay, so uh, Der Stiefel asks about the awesome limited silk Grand Seiko pocket squares that you hooked them up with at watch time. Uh, <laughs> those are very limited, right? Wear it all the time and love it. <laughs> awesome. Well, no, I'm glad to hear that because I don't, I don't even know if we have any more. <laughs> yeah, I think the uh, goodies pipeline has been drying up a little bit. Uh, uh, yeah, it yeah. Certainly and I, I think that might be a consequence of what's going on with the uh, uh, epidemic here. So, yeah, uh, that will also be affected because of it too. Okay, so here's a good one. Any plans to enter the smart watch arena for Grand Seiko? Yeah, I don't foresee that. Ed. No, I don't, I don't, think, I don't, so think, I don't think there's a reason to. <laughs> no. Could Seiko potentially? I don't know, you know, but uh, no, I don't. I don't ever see that happening for Grand Seiko. Right. So um, then, uh, uh, someone asks, uh, does uh, Grand Seiko 
hold trademarks on the snowflake name or is that still just a nickname no that was just a nickname it's uh you know it started as kind of like an internal nickname that spread mm -hmm. to to us at least the first time i heard it which was back at uh, uh around 2011 i want to say maybe the end of mm -hmm. 2010 2011 uh, was from someone from the factory so that was the first time i had ever heard it mm -hmm. um and it, you know it's uh i don't think it was intended to stick but mm -hmm. it did yeah so, so i think they're more into uh holding patents than trademarks at this point so <laughs> um let's see so uh this is a good one uh joe uh what would be your ultimate three-piece grand seiko combo meal deal Ooh, man, Ooh, that's, yeah, that's a good one. That it? is certainly tough. Yeah. Well, I I have to say that um, you know the the pinnacle in spring drive to me so far, um, I would actually say is probably the eight day power reserve in platinum. I think that's one of the finest watches that we have made, uh, and you know I mean with good reason. Um, obviously this is going to be way out of my, uh, you know, my price range. Uh, it's not something that, uh, I can just dive into. Um, same, same goes also for this high beat. So as, as most people, you know, know about me, I'm constantly wearing a spring drive and a high beat at the same time, uh, because those are the two pinnacles of Grand Seiko. So the 9R01 caliber, I find to be like the, the best of the best of spring drive. This new caliber though, you know, could could be, uh, you know, doesn't have the hand finishing, but, you know, we can touch on that on, a, on another time. The um, the high beat that we're just introducing now would also be another pinnacle piece, but again, way out of the price range. Um, so I think to stick to a more normal price tag, I would say that I that I have most of everything that I that I want. Snowflake is still to this day one of my favorite pieces uh mm -hmm. that i have owned and i still own of course the high beat gmt uh sbg j203 with the black dial and and red gmt hand mm -hmm. uh it's, you know you always see on my wrist i'll switch out the spring drive uh snowflake you know I'm, i'll wear the chronograph i'll wear other ones but the high beat gmt is kind of always the same mm -hmm. though i've been considering getting it with the white dial and the blue gmt hand too mm -hmm. and i already own that with seiko grand seiko dial so oh, you want okay you do so you're talking about the sb uh gj 201 is that right i have the 203 and uh, no, I have the but you you said the, the 201 is the white dial version right? i would even consider adding yeah, yeah. because it's well, you know i like white and blue yeah we have but, one here uh, joe if you're interested give me a call oh awesome yeah All right. okay good uh awesome. Awesome. yeah so, so uh I, mean, I could live with just two watches yeah maybe maybe yeah so um, a uh, functional question, if you wear the uh, watch only on weekends, should you keep the watch winder on a, keep it on a watch winder or just hand wind it when it wears down and uh, will either cause damage to the movement? I, I mean, personally, I, I, I kind of stopped using winders. I, I still own winders um, and I, I certainly see the relevance to them. Um, you know, spring drive with a three day power reserve, I, I, you might as well just manually wind that one. Mm -hmm. Um, I beat with 55 hour power reserve. I see a little more practical sense to use, uh, a, a, a winder because it's a little bit shorter, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, I like winding my watches, so I don't yeah, mind. I'm with you. I'm, I, <laughs> I dropped using a winder. I like to interact with a piece. Yep. So, uh, Robert Harlan says his next piece will be the blue dial gold bezel gmt sbge 248 yeah that's is, a great piece. is that boutique only no no it's not no, it's boutique only but uh, another piece that's been uh, very staggered allocation so uh. you know you see this with all of our precious metal models mm -hmm. we don't you know, we don't produce a lot of them mm -hmm. so you're not it's very rare occasion you're going to see them like in store somewhere or right. anything like that even in japan you don't see you know a ton of this stuff Unless you go to like our big flagships like Waco or you know something right. like that, so um, yeah, that, I mean that's a great piece and you know okay. production. All right, <laughs> uh, 
Joe, Grand Seiko released some JDM 9F divers not too long ago. We talked about 9F divers in Maryland at Steve's place. Do you think we would get uh, some in the future in the U.S.? I love 9F and divers. Yeah, I you know, I don't know. Um, as, as it stands right now, uh, those are Japanese domestic models, so they're, they're, not, uh, they're not for import into the U.S. Um, I hope maybe that changes down the road. I, I remember, uh, you know, back, this is, you know, going back quite a few years now, there were the, the Seiko Grand Seiko version of quartz divers. And, um, you know, back when I was in, in, on the retail side, like yourself, you know, it, they sold very well, but it wasn't, it wasn't huge. You know, I, I would expect right. it to be huge. I mean, I, I thought they were amazing, mm -hmm. you know, and the ones are, are awesome too, but I don't, uh, you know, I don't know if they're, you know, kind of scaling them back and keeping them in Japan because it, they're, you know, potentially not, uh, you know, going to be big sellers for around four, you know, four plus grand. Mm. I don't know. I couldn't answer that question, but. I think uh, with 9F gaining uh, great acceptance, at least in this group, uh, I think they would be great sellers. Yeah. So, um, are, are you getting tired out, or can we ask a few more questions of you? No, I'm good for a few more questions. Okay, great. Um, Boozer asks, how did Nissan and Grand Seiko come together to collaborate on that crazy ceramic chronograph? <laughs> <laughs> well, what's even crazier is, uh, you know, I can't tell you exactly the story of how it all started with, with Nissan, unfortunately. I just don't, uh, you know, uh, being based in the States, I don't have, you know, all the insider mm -hmm. stuff. But... What I can tell you is it started much crazier than the watch we saw here in the U.S. at 21 grand. <laughs> it started with a limited uh, custom watch. You would be able to actually, it was the same design, the, the ceramic hybrid design. But uh, I think they limited it to only a few pieces being made. You could custom choose all the metals, the dial color, the ceramic color. And these things were like $200,000. So wow. if you thought the one was crazy here... You should have seen what they did in Japan, and they only did it, like I said, a few of. So. Wow. Okay. Interesting. Thanks. Uh, Ultraman One Red says hi all. Hi. How are you? And uh, this is a nice one. Uh, Luis asks Joe if you could choose any gold Grand Seiko for Steve to wear, which would you choose for him? Gold. Yes. Hmm. That is tough. Hmm. I, you know, I mean, I, as I mentioned before, I love the eight day and I think the rose gold is, is phenomenal. I prefer the platinum personally, mm -hmm. uh, but I almost think that, uh, the SBG Y002 would be a better fit for you. I don't see you in the heavy 43 millimeter, you no, know, no, you could pull it off certainly, but you know, I think you would prefer, you know, overall shape size of the SBG Y002. So that would be the one I would probably pick for you. Well, there's a great hunger on this channel for the 002, as you may know. And yeah, uh, we hope that you can pull some strings and get a couple our way. Not to I, put I, you on the spot. It'll happen not to... eventually. I just don't know timelines. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay, so uh, our followship seems to be growing rather than diminishing. So let's hang in for a little bit here. No uh, we have 38 watching now. Uh, so, Lo, Lo, Ro, Lobo Rojo 777, a uh, new handle to me, asks, uh, the GS automatics are a great way to get into the brand. I wish more was done to promote these watches with the 9S movements. No, absolutely. Yeah. I, I think that you're 100% right about that. A lot of people don't realize uh, what you get in, not talking about the high beat, just talking about the 8-beat, the, the three-day power reserve mechanical movement. You get a lot in those. Mm -hmm. you know, it's much for, for the money. And, I mean, yeah, okay, you can say, oh, it's an automatic, but I can get an automatic ETA for, you know, whatever. It, it's a totally different world of watchmaking. And, mm -hmm. you know, the big benefits that go into our high beat are also in our eight beat movement, the nine S six series. So there's, there's a lot of, uh, great aspects of that movement that can be had, you know, around five grand. Yeah. So I agreed. 
So uh, Nick Jung asks, does the new spring drive movement mean we're getting more compact spring drive sport watches? That is a good question. As it stands, no. If you see the new sport model, it is still the large case. So that's a, you know almost 47 millimeter watch. Uh, we've shaved a millimeter off of the thickness compared to the high beat, um, but it's still a professional grade dive watch. And, and you know the way that Seiko has been making their professional grade dive watches for a long time is this insane quality of construction. You know, when they did it in 1975 for the first tuna can, you know, over 20 different patented aspects of the case design. You know, this is this technology has carried over to Grand Seiko, of course, and uh, or at least similar to. So you need uh, you need a good amount of depth, a good amount of thickness in this type of watch. Um, could we make more recreational watches down the road? Uh, possibly. Yeah. OK, so. Um... This is an interesting one from Der Stiefel. Uh, uh, geographically, are there certain areas or countries which prefer certain movements regarding quartz versus mechanical? Uh, so, yes. Um, it does demographically change a bit, but I think most of the world is, is about the same where uh, most people gravitate towards spring drive and mechanical. But in Japan, everything is very evenly split which I find interesting. Hmm. interesting. It's a very even across the board, uh, you know, in yeah. terms of sales of by movement type, so. Okay, here's uh, one. Uh, why does Grand Seiko have their gold clasps made in Italy? Is that a uh, fact? It, so, yeah, I mean, some of the, some of the <laughs> clasps you're gonna see uh, on, on more recent models are gonna have, it's only on uh, 18 karat yellow gold or on uh, 18 karat rose gold. And I don't know if it's a, I, I don't know the answer to be honest with you. Uh, I have a feeling it's a, possibly a capacity thing, like how, you know, can, can we make those? Uh, you'll notice though, all the platinum and, and white is done in Japan, still, still is Japan. So mm -hmm. I don't know 100% what the answer is. Uh, it's kind of uh, boggling my mind as well. But I have a feeling at some point in time, uh, you will eventually see Japan on those. Okay, cool. So where can we buy a watch pendant like the one Joe is wearing in the video thumbnail? Are you talking about the little pin, the lapel pin? You, have you seen the, uh, did you look at the uh, thumbnail oh, we had, Joe? Oh, what's, yeah. uh, um, no, I, I mean, I saw, I, I think I saw it in the beginning when I just logged on, but it's, it's gone. In, it's in your lapel. I think it's the Grand Seiko pin. The, the, the one with the lion, I have quite a few. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, where can he buy one? A little lion on uh, yeah. it, then yeah, those those can be had. Those are still uh, those are still around. Uh, if it was a little one that's in the shape of a black ceramic chronograph, mm. those uh, those are not around. The ones that are shaped like watches were only uh, distributed at the GS9 Club. Um, mm -hmm. So those are you know those are very hard to come by, and I have a feeling that might have been what I was wearing. Mm. If it's a if it's a lion, they can they can be around. Right. Like with a gift with purchase? Yeah, of course. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so another question. Um, I wish Grand Seiko would offer quartz divers here. We just talked about that. And also offer more non-date Grand Seikos. I bought my SBGX261 and SBGN009 from Steve, but had to buy my Grand Seiko SBGX335 from Japan. Yeah, I, that's the way it is. I yeah. agree with that. We would much rather you buy them in the U.S., but you know, unfortunately, they yeah. they do hold things to uh, you know to certain markets. So in Japan, obviously, having uh, 50 years ahead of us in terms of sales of Grand Seiko, mm -hmm. they always uh, the Japanese market does still come first, of course. Right. So Joe, uh, wrist check. Uh, he knows you're wearing two watches. What's on the wrist? Believe it or not, no, uh, I, I'm actually not. I, I'm wearing a quartz uh, GS today, one of the tough mm -hmm. quartz. So, um, you know, it's a, it's kind of a lazy day, as every day has been for the last couple of weeks, and, and quartz is always ready to go. Very convenient. Okay, that, that brings <laughs> up uh, my question. Uh, what happens at tough quartz? 
So, um, I mean, we were just sailing along with those beauties and then kaput. I know. It's, it's a shame. And I was, uh, you know, I feel bad, actually. You know, I, I kind of wish this, uh, this didn't get brought up. I, I really uh, <laughs> shouldn't have. I should have lied and said I was wearing something else. They're right. Um, the the tough quartz you know as as we uh, were talking about earlier we introduced the new version of the of the 9f caliber mm -hmm. uh, the 9f85 which is essentially replacing the 9f82 um so they were they've been out of production uh on on the 9f82 uh the tough quartz that you saw on the cordura strap mm -hmm. um right now as it stands we have the new version with the new movement coming in the limited edition format so still that same case, uh, you know, that great case design. I beautiful, beautiful case, case design. design. Yeah. Um, so, but with blue ceramic bezel now. So that's going to be, uh, and that's probably been one of the, you know, most talked about, I think, of the first four models that we introduced uh, was that uh, it's not out yet. So people mm -hmm. haven't really seen it in person much. But that new tough quartz with the, with the blue dial, the limited edition, uh, mm -hmm. that's, yeah, that's what we're looking at now. Excellent. So uh, we're going to wind it down pretty soon. Uh, uh, we've had this fellow on for about an hour on the griddle. And uh, so I'm going to take a couple more questions here okay. and then uh, let you go uh, get some dinner. And I know you have at least two more uh, long trainings for the rest of the week. So oh, yeah. uh, let you rest up for those. If it's only two. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, more probably. So, but uh, the people aren't going away. They're still here. They want to hear you. So, uh, let's see. Uh, very, uh, I'm going to skip a couple. Quartz, grab and go. Good way to look at it. Uh, I, I don't care what anyone says. I think quartz is great as long as it's a Grand Seiko quartz. Um, and, this is true. <laughs> okay, here's a, a counterpoint. Uh, Guys, nothing to compete with day date in the U.S. Okay, point taken. And we, uh, yeah, I mean, we have day date models. So, um, you know, the day date feature we saw on the 2018 9F 25th anniversary mm -hmm. uh, limited edition, but that's it. Yeah. So, so uh, Craig Ship, uh, our channel host, uh, 9F heavy use grab and go. And uh, Craig Ship frequently says he can't go back to wearing Rolex because he's been spoiled by GS. Uh, Joe, do you collect other brands besides GS? Uh, I mean, I, I did heavily, um, and, and probably until about the time I bought my Snowflake, which was uh, January 2012, and that changed it. Uh, after that, I was, uh, I was pretty much... Uh, you know, I'd buy new watches and they'd last maybe a couple of weeks. So um, I still have, you know, I still have some Swiss and German brands, mm -hmm. uh, even, you know, a couple uh, of G-Shocks and stuff like that. But, mm -hmm. you know, I really, I mean, for far longer than I've worked for the brand, um, I, I've really focused my attention to Grand Seiko mm -hmm. uh, as well as Seiko. I still have uh, a lot of Seiko stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I collected for a long term, uh, some vintage, but I never wear my vintage stuff. Hmm. I got scared one day when it rained really hard when I was living in Miami and condensation started to come on the inside of the crystal on, on a pretty rare piece that I had. So, mm -hmm. I was, uh, I was yeah. like, all right, I'm not wearing these out anymore. Okay. Good idea. Okay. Joe, yeah. we've, uh, eaten an hour of your time. It's been fabulous. Uh, the uh, wa uh, watchership is still growing, but I'm going to let you go. I'll hang on for a few minutes afterwards, uh, as requested. One last question, and then you're off. Uh, Leon asks, will Grand Seiko offer a solar model? I don't foresee that either. Uh, and to just kind of quickly touch on that, you know, a solar panel is another thing that could potentially go, you know, wrong. Um, you know, just another piece of electronics to add to the watch. And with 9F, there's really a focus on staying away from adding more electronics. Mm. So, you know, when okay. you look at that movement, there's not, there's not a whole lot of electronics in it. Sure. Okay. Well, great. Uh, we'll let you go. Have dinner. Stay safe. Uh, we really appreciate it.
Well, uh, thank you for for listening this to you know listening to us back and forth for a little while and some great questions. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I didn't have better answers sometimes, but you know. Well, well, some were bet. off limits, weren't they? Yeah, so. you know, what are you gonna do? Okay, so I'm gonna catch the rest of your training myself tomorrow. So uh, got too interrupted yesterday and uh, want to hear the rest of it. So. It well, thank you. Okay. I appreciate, uh, appreciate you joining me for that, too. You're going to be okay. sick of my voice by the end of this week. Oh, yeah. No, really. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. All right. Take care now. Take Thank, care. Thanks thank so much. Yeah. All right. Bye. Okay. Bye. Okay. So I will hop on a bit more. And uh, uh, let's see. We are. Joe's off. And uh, so. Uh, what do you think, guys? Now, Craig's not going to get on. He's just watching today. Uh, I think Craig is worn out by the pace he's been keeping. And uh, uh, we need an after show. I guess that's a Craig. So, Craig, you have nothing to say? You, you don't want to Skype on, say hello to everybody? Well... They, they're, they're really begging for it. Craig probably didn't shave today and it's uh, not wearing uh, a press shirt is my guess. What do you think? Okay, so uh, if nothing else is going on, uh, uh, this is, I think, has been a fabulous show. Joe is... Uh, uh, unbelievable in terms of his knowledge of the brand and uh, obviously is uh, a great representative for Grand Seiko and we've enjoyed having him here at the store and have uh, seen him in many events uh, in uh, Switzerland and uh, elsewhere and uh, Derek comments uh, Joe shied away from dealing with the day date issue and uh, David uh, and he watches, uh, do I want to show you? I just have two out. I have the snowflake. We'll just uh, touch on that guy again. And I also have the uh, SBGP007, uh, the uh, blue dial uh, novelty, which I will put up. And beautiful piece. And that is blue. There, we're nice focus. And that's the high accuracy quartz. And with independent uh, uh, hour hand. So. And there, Stiefel asks, uh, did I see his last comment about the GS and the Zodiac? Um, sorry, I didn't. Uh, actually, uh, there's just two of us here in the store, uh, my wife and myself. Everybody else is working from home, and we are swamped with uh, questions, phone, text, uh, uh, text from our website, uh, emails, whatever. So I'm very behind and have to apologize to folks for that. Um, but I think uh, you understand under the circumstances. And... Uh, did anything surprise me today about what I heard? I had uh, just listened to Joe yesterday um, in the uh, retailer training, and so I learned a few pieces, uh, a few things from that about the movements, uh, but nothing else surprising. I think uh, uh, not so much. Uh, and will I be offering those GS pins? If I can get my hands on them, uh, we've just had a discussion about uh, the little uh, the goodies, the gifts with purchase, and uh, that pipeline's drying up a little bit uh, due to the uh, uh, the problems uh, that we're having with the uh, virus. So uh, when things get back to normal or more toward normal, uh, we will definitely uh, reach out to try to get them and the hats and the other things we're able to provide with uh, when you buy a watch from us. And, okay, good to be busy, it is. So uh, that is it. Uh, just uh, reminding everybody, although we're not 
fully present here in our store. Uh, we are almost fully operational. We set everybody up uh, working from home. We're going to be producing some nice videos that will be uh, on our website, on Facebook, uh, and uh, some will be on uh, YouTube, either here or uh, on the Little Treasury channel. And uh, uh, a question from Der Stiefel, interested in SBGN001. Uh, and that Zodiac, okay, if you have them. SBGN001 is long gone. That sort of stuttered a little bit in the beginning. Uh, I think people were taken aback by the look and uh, went a little slowly, and then wham, they were all gone. So, and I haven't seen any on the pre-owned market either. So, uh, sorry about that. We can talk about the Zodiac offline. And uh, Kyle Jett loves uh, the GS hat, by the way. Uh, we sent him one with his uh, piece. And uh, they make a nice hat indeed. And uh, I have to be honest, we are, I think that was the last one until we get replenished. But don't let that keep you from uh, purchasing your next Grand Seiko. Okay. So Tom Austin, hi. We're just on the way off. And... Uh, if anybody else has anything to contribute, let's do it now. Otherwise, I'm going to uh, grab my little beeper and do my exit. Okay, so 33 watching. Uh, if you like this show, please click like and share it and follow the channel if uh, you're new here. Okay, so that's it. I'm going home for dinner. And uh, appreciate you all uh, getting aboard.